Hello and welcome to Hysteria. I'm Erin Ryan. And I'm Alyssa Mastromonaco. Alyssa, how many Blueys, Blanchettes, and Hemsworth would it take for Australia to make up for the fact that it is responsible for Rupert Murdoch? Erin, I have to be honest, those people do nothing for me. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Australia owes us all a koala and new Uggs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alyssa, time for the news, a.k.a. exit interviews with hideous men. (laughs) It's been a week. Yeah, HT David Foster Wallace. Um, Okay, so the head of NBC Universal was ousted on Sunday, which I was pretty sure was going to be the top media headline of the week until Monday when it was announced that Tucker Carlson would no longer be hosting his primetime show on Fox News and and that Don Lemon's 17-year reign of terror at CNN had also come to an end. Uh, And then on Tuesday, amid Disney layoffs, it was announced that 538 founder and loudly and frequently wrong stats man Nate Silver was parting ways with ABC. So, Alyssa, if the three of them, Tucker, Don, and Nate, were hired to co-host the View-style talk show called The Wrongest Bitches in the Game, where they sat on a comfortable-looking living room set and shouted bad opinions at each other, would you watch? Absolutely not, Erin. They deserve no more eyeballs. It is time for them to go learn how to paint. Go learn how to paint. Go (laughs) paint dogs, paint cats, paint, feed some fucking birds. Do something, but just, you got your chance. You used it. You threw it away. Time to go. Yeah. Yeah. I feel I feel kind of the same way. Something. So the Tucker Carlson firing. Well, at first it wasn't clear that it was a firing. It was an right. abrupt departure. <laughs> but as more reporting has come out, it's become pretty clear that it was not Tucker's decision. It no. seems that uh, reporting is indicating it was Rupert Murdoch's decision. Um, so, you know, he, he seems to have gotten fired. I am super intrigued about the story behind all this. Yes. There's a lot of there's a lot of rumors floating around. What's your favorite rumor about oh, Tucker? Oh, okay. My favorite rumor so far is that uh, Fox News, which Erin, you flagged this story for me. Fox News has like a dossier on Tucker in case he decides to come after them. That they have just a trove of uh, stories about Tucker, the misogyny on his set, what a shithead he is, more texts that we haven't seen. I mean, Aaron, it is it is delicious in so many ways. A man who terrorized America and brought Fox News to the top of cable is now going to take Fox News down. Right. And yeah, I was um I wrote a piece about Tucker leaving for the Daily Beast that was kind of like dancing on his grave. Yes. Um, but, you know, something that that uh, I think Forbes pointed out was that with Tucker's exit from Fox News, there's like a fo- there's a Tucker shaped hole yes. in the Fox News lineup. And that is seven hundred million dollars mm. worth of market share. Somehow. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure where they arrived at that figure. It seems pretty big. But, you know, it also is big is seven hundred eighty seven million dollars, which is what Fox News just settled uh, its Dominion lawsuit for last week. So Fox News's uh, Fox Corporation's st- uh, uh, stock has just been tanking over the last few days um, over, you know, the loss of Tucker Carlson, one of their marquee personalities. Um, this settlement and the fact that there are more lawsuits coming down the pipe yeah. related to dis and misinformation in the wake of the 2020 election. Um, is this delicious or what? Oh, it's delicious. It's delicious. <laughs> this is the arc of the moral universe bending towards justice right now, Aaron. This is – he literally has terrorized so many people and gone after so many people at any chance um, that, you know, also, why should we fucking feel sorry for him? He's so fucking rich. I don't like, feel he is sorry for him. Well, so I mean, maybe rich. not for long. No, no, maybe not for long. But but to me, it's like, you know, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. Yeah. I mean, I was I didn't watch this on purpose. It was pointed out to me. Um, but Bill O'Reilly, who, again, I oh, never, I watched this, too. I watched yeah, this, yeah. too. He he kind of has he more than most people outside of Fox would have insight into what could possibly be going on. And he indicated that there's he believes for one reason or another that there is information about Tucker 
that has yet to come out or a mm. role that Tucker is about to play in a lawsuit that hasn't become publicly available knowledge yet that is such a liability for Fox that they had to get rid of. It was like if he would have stayed, it would have cost them more right. than just getting rid of him, which I think is really intriguing. I think there's a lawsuit by Smartmatic coming up. Yep. Um, what, what, what did you want to add, Alyssa? No, Smartmatic. No, I was just going to say that the – interesting thing about all of this that I read in one of the business magazines was that Tucker for Fox, it'll be interesting to see what him leaving actually does do to Fox because they were saying that because his audience is so old and white, that from an advertising perspective, it's he himself was not, his audience is not that big a draw for advertisers, but it's that they, they can't tell and they won't know for a while if he was actually what was driving cable subscriptions to watch Fox, cable, you know, uh, cable mm-hmm. subs. And that it'll, it'll be interesting to see if actually him leaving does hurt Fox that much. I don't know. Hmm. We'll see. We'll see. That'll, you know what happens when I start reading the, the business rags. Yeah, we get bored. Everybody <laughs> gets guess. bored. That's that's bore that's boring journalism. Until it's not. Until, <laughs> Until it's, it's exciting. Not. Um so Don Lemon leaving CNN, I think that we cannot emphasize enough the fact that this person was not a pleasant person to work with for many mostly female colleagues. Yep. Um we found out right literally hours after it was announced that Tucker and Fox were parting ways that um Lemon had been informed that he was being cut by CNN by his agent. Agent. (laughs) He wrote wrote in a screenshot that he posted to Twitter, after 17 years at CNN, I would have thought that someone in management would have had the decency to tell me directly. At no time was I ever given any indication that I would not be able to continue to do the work that I've loved at the network. It is clear that there are some larger issues at play. With that said, I want to thank my colleagues and the many teams I have worked with for an incredible run. You know who I want to talk to? Who? I want to talk to Soledad O'Brien. Who just... I, I, I want to talk to Caitlin Collins. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to talk to um, to uh, yeah any one of his like female colleagues or people who right? have worked Wasn't with him. Wasn't his first beef with Nancy Grace? <laughs> Yes, he did. Oh, my God. I want to talk to Nancy Grace. We want to talk to Nancy Grace. Though Nancy. apparently when she has been asked about him, she has she has demured. had no comment. Yes, yes. She's demurred. In the, there was a piece that ran, I want to say, a month and a half ago. I mean, what is time? It could have been a month ago. Could Whatever. It could be yesterday. Ago. Who knows? A, a long piece on Don Lemon's uh, yeah. general. I, and when I say reign of terror, I was like halfway joking. But truly, for some people that he was working with, he was deeply, deeply unpleasant. And he kept getting chances from management at CNN, yep. which must have been very frustrating. Um, I, I, you know, Nancy Grace, a person close to Nancy Grace was quoted in the piece, but Nancy Grace herself yes. declined to comment. But Soledad, DGAF, she was just <laughs> like, uh, yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> I mean, she didn't say fuck that guy, but that was the gist of what she said. This, I mean, look, over the years, I have actually randomly watched a lot of Don Lemon, and I was uh, an active watcher, uh, am an active watcher of the morning show. Like, look, back in the day when Don Lemon did his nighttime show, and he signed on once and said, this is CNN tonight, I'm Don Lemon, the president of the United States is racist, and a lot of us already knew that. I appreciated that someone was saying it out loud. But Mm -hmm. like watching the morning show, I was like, at first I'm like, they should just not have him on in the morning. I don't think he can handle being a morning person because he would just go bonkers. But at the same time, CNN is like refusing to admit that they've known this shit for a long time. And they're pointing to a bunch of recent interviews that he did being like, oh, this was the straw that broke the camel's back when he was interviewing some, uh, the, one of the guys who's running in the GOP primary who was explaining to Don Lemon the black experience. And I was like, yo, you just baited Don Lemon. This is going to go south so fast. Mm -hmm. And it did. But like, don't give me a break. That's not... I watched that interview and I was like, are they trying to get Don Lemon to implode so they can fire him? And then like a week later, he was fired. Aaron, what if mm-hmm. I was a witch? What if I was a witch when I was watching that? I mean, that? we've pretty much established that you are. I mean, um, like I'm a morning po- TV witch. <laughs> You're a morning TV. You got all the, you got the cats for it. I got you the got cats the- and the fleeces. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that that's a good point because a lot of stuff that Don Lemon said on air is stuff that like, I'm like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's a correct, that's a correct statement. Seems right. But- 
you can't just run around like r- remember like the p pe- in the piece about him being just like a, a wild guy to work with yeah um, he he like set up an anonymous email account to th- and like left he had a burner like, phone yeah like threatening <laughs> yes. co-workers because he was upset about them getting assignments that he wanted and yes. he just was he was really look look you can you can have extremely correct opinions but if you're a pain in the ass to work with or you're scary to work with like get out no one needs extremely you extremely good opinions don't negate extremely bad behavior yeah i mean ask andrew cuomo who only had middlingly good opinions sometimes chris cuomo chris cuomo that's true both of them both that's of them that's Although I will say, you know, when I was doing a lot of CNN, HLN stuff mm-hmm. like four years ago now, um, Chris Cuomo was always very, very nice, although a bit of a himbo. And <laughs> Don Lemon was always kind to me, but not other people that I knew. Um, so, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I just like have memories of Chris Cuomo like sauntering into hair and makeup like he was a politician being like hey everybody good night good night everybody and people were like okay that's fine you can come and say like you know anderson cooper would be in there getting his makeup done and just kind of like roll his eyes very like (laughs) subtly because he uh preferred silence anyway um okay uh the nate silver thing i feel like a less a little less grave dancey about no it's Um, like you know what you had a good run He's annoying on Twitter, but that doesn't mean that he should get fired. And I, and I am worried about the state of the entertainment industry with like Disney making all these layoffs and so many layoffs. Yeah, and us kind of heading careening, if you will, toward a writer's strike yep. uh, on May first, which could uh, just letting everyone know, just hug your content now, Close. look it in the eyes and tell you tell it how much you love it because there might be a content desert. Uh, starting yep. starting May 1st if things don't get resolved with the WGA. Um, final thing, weird week for strange men. I'm not talking about President Joe Biden because he, he, although he is a little, he's quirky. He's got some quirks. He's got quirks. He's, Who doesn't he's want got, a quirk? We all have quirks. I think wanting to be the president is a quirk. Like there's I don't something, disagree. There's something kind of wrong with you if you want to be the president. I've- like, no. Terrible, Come terrible, on. terrible job. Sorry to the presidents that I like, Jimmy Carter and Barack Obama, <laughs> uh, and to an extent, Joe Biden. Um, but he is running for re-election. He is. We're, we're going to see where that goes. I honestly want to buy some of his dark branded merch. It's cool. It's pretty good. Uh, uh, two thumbs up to the merch to the merch team. It's legitimately cool. I think I'm probably going to, as soon as we get done recording, get me a t-shirt of dark branded. Um, no, the strange man I was talking about is Elon Musk. Not any- so confusing. So confusing. <laughs> what is wrong with him? He, like, he, I think, like Don Lemon, has no impulse control. Yeah. Uh, also well, weird. Weird. Yeah. So, like, did he get hit on the head a lot? Like, his, is there, like, a frontal lobe issue? How do you what? say his child's name if you refer to the child? Elon Musk's kid. I, I don't know. I just wanted to like make sure. Unpronounceable. Ex- so it was revealed this week that Elon Musk has been tweeting as his two-year-old son. So weird. Uh, his last tweet dated Monday said, I will finally turn three on May 4th. The reason that we know this isn't because Musk was like, hey, guess what? I'm pretending to be my my two-year-old son. No. Um, the Twitter owner shared a screen cap of his profile on Monday, which showed that he had an alternative, uh, alternative account on the top right-hand side of the app. And the profile picture was matched to this account of an adult tweeting as a two-year-old child. Very, very weird. Um, also, the SpaceX launch didn't go great. People no. were saying, Yikes. people were saying it's like a miracle that oh, it's so wonderful that it flew as far as it did. But yeah, like there was debris that shot Everywhere. out in all directions. Yeah, I mean, Aaron, it was nothing but a succession-y week. It's like the Roy's are going down, the spaceship is blowing up. <laughs> I know. Could they have hoped for a better set of real life events to serve as cross promotion? Literally the to this greatest, season? the greatest cross promotion t- trick stunt of all time. Oh my god! I I had an a horrible idea when I was like cooking yesterday, which was like, what if the writers of Succession tried to end the series? with the same spirit that the writers of Game of Thrones ended the series, like the worst possible way. (laughs) I think it would end with like Tom and Shiv getting in a car accident and then like my husband Josh pointed out like, and then there would be like no comment and no time for us to handle it. And then there would be like 
Logan Roy would come back from the dead and be yes. like, I was just faking. You know, kidding. It just, I was yeah. kidding. You yeah. fucking pedest, you nosy pedestrians. I'm yeah. back. So consider that uh, prompt food for thought for the rest of the day. What is the bad ending of succession? Because <laughs> um, you know that the writers aren't going to take us there. Okay. Uh, that's all the time we have for news. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we are going to talk to a Democrat in a red state who has been doing really important work when it comes to abortion access, especially in light of the Supreme Court's recent decision to keep an abortion pill on the market. So stick around. We'll be right back. And welcome back. You're listening to Hysteria. Let's start this part of the show with a clip that I think sums up the way a lot of red state progressives feel. My parents have done so much for me. I need to be here. I need to be here for them as they age. Um, when they age. I don't think they'd admit that they're aging yet. Um, but I also want to be close to my children as they grow up and become adults. And I want to be there if, God willing, I get to have grandkids someday. And um, I think my mom would say that she paid it forward, all that she and my dad did for us, and I want to do that for my grandkids. But I can't encourage my two daughters to settle in Idaho with the laws we have on the books. Um, I would be terrified to have my daughters try to carry a pregnancy here. Uh, this is not a safe place to be pregnant. I think the statute is tearing families apart and is pushing our ob guys out of state, and this bill does nothing to change that. Um, I declared a Rule 80 because I am a, um, I'm a person with a uterus of childbearing age, and um, if you care about those of us in this position, I urge you to do much better than this. The voice you just heard is our guest today. She is a member of the Idaho House of Representatives and the chair of the Idaho Democratic Party. Welcome to Hysteria, Representative Lauren Nekochea. Thank you so much for having me. So, Representative, you went viral earlier this month after taking the House floor and talking about the impact anti-abortion laws have had on you and your family. For listeners who may not be familiar, tell us what prompted you to speak. What is your message to the legislature and by extension to the people of Idaho? I don't think our legislators understand or are willing to acknowledge the impact of the laws they have put on the books. And I, you know, they sometimes it feels like their brains leave their bodies when an abortion bill comes up, all critical thinking stops and they all get in lockstep and they all vote the same way. And there's just no recognition of what it what it really means. And there are those of us like me who want full reproductive rights back. And I won't stop until until we get that. Um, but anyone who just cares about people being able to carry a pregnancy safely in the state of Idaho should be very concerned. We are losing our, our OB guys. We have already lost more than two thirds of our maternal fetal medicine specialists in this state. They, they're the ones who deal with the most complicated pregnancies. Uh, so as we criminalize doctors, uh, it threatens all health care and the safety um, of, of every Idahoan. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure when you took the floor that day, you weren't like, I'm going to go viral. Um, what impact has your speech had on people? And have you heard uh, from constituents about it? Um, yeah, I've just heard. And, you know, I've been talking about abortion for a long time in this state. For some reason, it's something they always have to talk about. And as one of my colleagues says, it's because you can't fundraise off of last year's abortion bill. So I have had four legislative sessions under my belt. We've always been debating abortion, even when we had the protections of Roe v. Wade. And over the years, a number of people have reached out and just told me their deeply personal stories that only reinforce the need for a government to get out of the exam room. Um, but, you know, most recently my husband came home from work and someone had approached him and said, oh, is your wife that, that legislator? We're having the same conversations in my family. You know, I have a daughter who's a young 20 something and it doesn't feel safe uh, for her to be here. On Friday, the Supreme Court voted to keep the abortion pill mifeprestone available on a national level. What do you make of this decision? Do you think mifeprestone is here to stay? I certainly hope so. It's so well needed. And we still have access problems in Idaho because our abortion laws are so extreme. I just heard from a hospital leader a few days ago that a woman was experiencing a miscarriage. She needed uh, she needed medication. Uh, to to complete that. And it was prescribed she, that she got over the hurdle of the doctor prescribing it. But then a pharmacy wouldn't fill that prescription because they were worried about legal action against the pharmacy. 
So the access problems continue. Um, the idea that a safe drug would be taken off the shelf by a far right activist judge is terrifying. So I think we can breathe a sigh, somewhat a sigh of relief um, with the Supreme Court's decision. But in Idaho, we're still facing risks and delays in care and potentially denied care uh, that's absolutely necessary. Mm hmm. So the conservative legal strategy for the last several decades, especially when it comes to abortion, has been to kind of throw spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks, basically trying to pass all kinds of extremist unconstitutional laws and see what the courts like won't strike down. So in that spirit, as somebody working in a deep red state that is fertile ground for more spaghetti style legislation, what are you seeing as the next front in the battle over reproductive justice? Yeah, well, it's surprising to see just how much of that really bad spaghetti is sticking. <laughs> I just feel like we have bad, bad spaghetti all over us in Idaho. You know, what we still have the bounty law on the books that was designed as a workaround around Roe v. Wade. You can be a rapist family member and sue for for these bounties if the victim has an abortion. Uh, it was the Republicans said this was a clever workaround. They didn't repeal it. <laughs> and that's the thing about the bad spaghetti. They never repeal it. It never comes back off. So we still have bounties that rapist family members can sue for. These cash cash awards. Uh, the, uh, the other new piece of spaghetti they flung out at the wall this year um, was trying to uh, create, create a very clever travel ban um, that doesn't read like a travel ban, but they've criminalized uh, transport transporting a minor within the state of Idaho for the purpose of getting a lawful abortion out of state. And so we'll see, we're waiting for that legal challenge to, to get filed and we'll see how that plays out. But you can imagine a 17 year old uh, raped by a family member who might not be able to get that parental permission. Maybe the father is the perpetrator might not be able to get that, uh, that parent to take them across the state to get out of state to get a lawful abortion. So they're trying everything they can and every maneuver to kind of build a wall around our state and prevent people from from accessing the abortion care they desperately need. Um, so kind of expanding the spaghetti to continue this metaphor to include other ways that rights are being attacked. How else are Idaho conservatives attacking the rights of everybody who isn't a white cis male or a fetus? So they also this session criminalized gender affirming care for young people and just a really heartbreaking move. And this is uh, this is another way that people are going to have to leave the state to get their care. And then they might not want to come back. And then we're going to have pediatricians who say, this is not how I want to operate. I don't want to serve patients in the state where a patient comes to me and I can't lawfully provide the care they need, care that's proven to reduce anxiety, depression, and suicidality in our kids, care that's been a lifeline for families where they, you know, saw their, their kiddo, you know, struggle, and then saw them re return to being healthy and thriving with gender affirming care. So just they keep finding new ways to criminalize Medicare, or medical medical care, and it's just going to continue to push physicians out of our state when we also we already have the lowest physician per capita ratio in the nation. Mm -hmm. You mentioned in the speech that we all just listened to a little bit of that you will encourage your daughters to leave the state as they get older because Idaho is no longer a safe place to be pregnant. We get that and totally understand it and people have to protect their health. But how do we protect the rights of people in places like Idaho whose rights are under attack but who don't have the resources to leave? Right. Right. That's exactly right. And I think that the specific words I said is that I can't encourage my dollar to my daughters to stay. And, it, you know, it's it's um, um, just to, to be precise, because I, I don't want to push them away. And I think what you said underscores why I'm here and why I keep fighting, because I can't, we can't I can't just roll over and let the, these extremist policies um Stay, stand without challenge because they, they're, they're impacting even the people who don't vote or can't vote or um, or don't realize what's what's really going on until it until it hits them personally. Or, you know, Republicans who vote for these legislators are still going to have gay transgender kids or they're going to they're going to know someone or be the person who needs abortion care. And so. It's it's just we it's it 
and for me, I think it mostly comes down to kids. I was an advocate for kids um, in, a, in, a, in the nonprofit sector before I came into the legislature. And the kids aren't voting for these um, awful politicians passing these awful policies. And those kids still need protection. And so that's why I'm staying here uh, for for the time being. And also, as I said, to take to be there for my parents who did so much for me. Um, but it's a terrible, terrible position that these politicians are are putting Idahoans in. Mm -hmm. So how can listeners from places outside of Idaho help lend support to people like you, minority voices in deep red states? Yeah. So I, I became a legislator not only because I wanted to pass good policies, but because I wanted to use it as a platform to elect better leaders. I spent so much time banging my head against the wall trying to get um, Idaho's legislators to make better decisions. And then I said, I want I want to now help voters make better decisions to elect better leaders. And, you know, my other role is as chair of the Idaho Democratic Party, because we're the only ones fighting for these rights and what it's going to take. And it's we're clear eyed about how long it's going to take is it's electing more Democrats in Idaho. We're seen as a flyover state when it comes to, you know, national Democratic <laughs> priorities and, and and what happens when when there's disinvestment in states like ours is that things get so horribly bad that people are literally going to die because of the policies that that these leaders are enacting. So donating to the Idaho Democratic Party, helping us elect more Democrats really will make a difference because they need the Republicans need to see some sort of um, ramifications for their behavior at the ballot box. Otherwise, they're going to feel emboldened. And they're going to keep throwing spaghetti at the wall. The other piece of spaghetti they threw at the wall this session was to uh, punish and take away resources from any city or county that says they aren't going to, uh, you know, fully investigate these, you know, potential abortions. And that's what they want. They want police knocking on your door, asking you about your miscarriage, asking you to show your medical, <laughs> you know, file. I mean, that this is what they want because the city of Boise said they were not going to divert police resources towards pregnancy investigations. And so the legislature came in and passed a bill to to try to punish any city that tries to do that. And, you know, they, they don't want to talk about I got gaveled down on that debate because they don't want to talk about pregnancy investigations because it sounds scary. It sounds terrible. Um, but that's exactly the reality that they want. And they are answer only to the hard line no abortion <laughs> whatsoever activists and are and have lost, stopped listening to reason and what their constituents actually want. Oh, man, I feel like you should at least be able to correctly label a like a diagram of the female reproductive anatomy. Yeah. At least be able to <laughs> label it before you try to start like legislating it. It is absolutely wild to me. And also, can you imagine if you've just suffered a miscarriage and a police officer wants you to talk to them about no. it? Yeah. Absolutely not. The very man who can't diagram your uterus. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's traumatic enough without having to relive it and defend yourself like you're a criminal or you might be a criminal because of something that happens every day to women everywhere. That is absolutely wild. Well, Representative, before we let you go, we'd like to end on a lighter note. Uh, what gives you hope? Um, I think what what does give me hope is, healing, is hearing these stories from women who have been impacted and who are angry and knocking on doors and talking to, you know, Republican women, or I had a libertarian on my list this last cycle who was, I think she wasn't thrilled about it, but she was voting <laughs> Democrat because we were the ones who were willing to restore her rights. So I think, I think we're waking up. I think it takes a little bit of a time because there is a little bit of a cognitive dissonance. I don't think people understand just how bad it is and that the Idaho Republican Party platform um, would uh, would ab outlaw abortion even when it's necessary to save the patient's life. They had a that's 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 their extreme position. Um, they had an amendment to try to have a life, you know, an exception for for the life of the patient. That by about a two thirds vote, that amendment died to their platform. So getting people, I think people are slowly starting to wake up. But I think it's sad about just how much it's going to take. I think it's going to take legislators themselves having a daughter who can't get in to see an obstetric gynecologist at all because there's no availability. Mm -hmm. um, so not not a super light note, but I, but I but I do see young people waking up and getting more involved, and that's what gives me hope. Well, thank you so much, Representative Lauren Nekochea. Thank you. Thank you for the work you do in Idaho, and thank you for that speech. Oh, such an honor to be here and appreciate all that you do. Take care. Thank you.